This is the expedition through Exodus, and we made it to chapter 33, and in chapter 33, you got the tent of meeting. The people are going to see the Lord in a cloud. The Lord's going to talk to Moses, meet with Moses, and Moses is going to see his back parts. And in Exodus 33, 9, it says, And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Okay, so the Lord talks with Moses frequently, audibly. And the Bible today for us is the word descending down to talk to you, the living word. The Lord talks to you through a book, just like he, just like he talked to Moses in an audible voice. And what you have actually is better than what Moses had. Because it's more sure. According to Peter, he calls it a more sure word of prophecy. You know, if something descended down and you could see it and it talked to you audibly, you wouldn't know for sure if that was a devil or an angel of the Lord. But you've got a book that you got faith in. You can put all your trust in it. That's a more sure word of prophecy. But you see, the Lord shows up here in a cloud or clouds many times and no wonder today you store stuff in the cloud. Like on my phone, it's got the cloud. Stuff's in the cloud. You can even purchase more cloud storage. Isn't that funny? Because everything you say goes up and gets stored in God's cloud. He sees everything, hears everything. And what you do is is recorded I mean, <clears throat> when it comes to your salvation he's not going to remember your sin obviously because you got the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus but what you're doing can cause rewards or a loss of rewards I mean it's not just the bad things that are seen it's the good things too but what you do is wrote down it's recorded Especially the lost, you know, they're going to pay for the bad things that they're doing in hell. And God's going to open the books. He's going to judge them according to their works. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And depending on how bad they were down here, that's how bad the lake of fire is going to be for them. So all these bad things they're doing, that's up going up, getting stored in the cloud. The good things you do, the good service you do for God with the right motive, that's stored. God's going to reward you for that. Now, like I said, as a Christian, the, the sins you commit, that stuff's under the blood. You're not going to uh, have to pay for that in eternity. You'll pay for it in the flesh down here. But it can cause you a loss of rewards at the same time. So Exodus 33, 10, all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. Notice the people saw it with their own two eyes. They were living in a time when the Lord was having people walk by sight. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, we don't walk by sight today. We're walking by faith, just like you know, he said to Thomas, you know, Thomas had to, you know, he said, unless I feel the, the prince in his hands, you know, I'm not going to believe. Uh, and the Lord told him, you know, bless, more blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. So people say if they could just see God, then they would believe and, you know, be on fire for God and go all out. But I mean, look at Israel. They're seeing God come down in a cloudy pillar at the tabernacle door, and they still fail to believe the promises of God. Now, Exodus thirty-three eleven, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. When you read the Bible, imagine you are speaking to God face to face. Moses, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. You can do that with the Bible. What you can do is read a verse and then pray a little bit. Read a verse and say, Yes, that's exactly right, Lord. Or, 
read a verse and say, okay, God, what does that mean? If you don't know what it means, say that. The Bible is God talking to you, and you praying is talking back to God, so you're speaking face to face in a way. Even though right now we can't see him face to face with our own two eyes, we can still be in fellowship. It isn't, it's not even a long distance relationship because I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. And in a sense, I'm already sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's not even a long distance relationship. It's an up close and personal relationship. And 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. One day I'll see him face to face. I'll be able to get up close and personal to the Godhead, even more so than Lucifer was as the anointed cherub. In Exodus 33, 20 through 23, it says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall... No man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So just imagine the scene in your mind. Moses in a cliff of the rock, and the Lord passing by. I imagine the dust spinning and swirling in the air, maybe a sound of thunder and lightning, and I'm sure Moses could feel the presence of God and, and His holiness. This would be an amazing scene. And the Lord today has me in a rock because I'm in Him and He is the rock. And I'm not just covered with His hand. I'm actually in His hand because I'm part of the body of Christ. Now, chapter 34, Moses makes new tablets of stone to uh, put the commandments on because, remember, he got the first ones broke back there in chapter 32. In Exodus 34, 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. So the Lord tells Moses to hew two tables of stones. And Hugh, H-E-W, that's kind of like a country boy's name. I got a cousin named that, but that's not what this is talking about. Hugh means to cut. Moses has to hew two new tables of stone because he broke the other ones in his rage. This shows that the Lord can inspire something more than once. This shows he can guide people in multiple copies of his words and not just an original one. Moses broke the first two tables when he found the children of Israel performing a satanic dance party. Kind of like they were at the 20, 23 Grammys or something. Uh, some people say he's the first person to break all Ten Commandments at the same time. And you've done that too because in James 2.10 it says, For whosoever shall keep the law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So remember he dropped those tablets of stone in a rage back there when he saw Israel uh, twerking and, and stuff down there at that satanic dance party and in Exodus 34 4 it says and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone Anytime you want to get something done, you need to rise up early in the morning, early to bed, and early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Like the saying, that's a true saying. And he's ready to get his tables of stone filled up. Every day I open my Interleaf Bible and I, that I got from Church Bible Publishers, and I'm ready to get it filled up with notes. In Exodus 34, 12, it says, Take heed to thyself. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, let it be, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. You see, you don't want to make a covenant like an agreement with wicked men, because it will end up coming back to bite you. You don't want a fellowship close with the lost world as they will rub off on you. So he doesn't want them shacking up with the lands around them, with the people of the land around them. In Exodus 34, 13, it says, But ye shall destroy their altars, 
break their images and cut down their groves. Notice how negative. Destroy, break, cut down. That's what you need to do to all the things in your life that's not pleasing to God. All the relationships that aren't pleasing to God. Today I can't come and vandalize somebody's property. I don't want to do that. That's not right. Even if it has wicked stuff all over it. So I can't just go destroy, break, and cut down physically. But I can, I, I can proclaim the word of God against stuff. You know, they got these Super Bowl halftime shows where they try to be as wicked as possible. And, you know, that's like their altars. And the people on stage can be the images that they worship. Now, you can't go and vandalize the stage, but you can proclaim how evil it all is and use your words to destroy, break, and cut down on the wickedness in the world. Because, you see, our battles are spiritual ones. We use spiritual weapons. We don't use force uh, physical force. We don't force anyone against their will to have our beliefs because then they really wouldn't have our beliefs. We don't use physical force. We don't use any violence when it comes to spiritual things because, you see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They aren't physical and earthly. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In Exodus 34, 14, it says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. You see, in this world, you are brainwashed into thinking that jealousy is a bad thing. Now, if it leads to something bad, it can be bad. Overdoing anything is going to lead to something bad. However, if a man isn't jealous over his wife, then something is wrong. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The Lord gets jealous when he sees his bride, us, going after other gods. The Father got jealous when he saw Israel going after other gods. It's only right for a man to get jealous when he sees another man flirting with his wife or when she flirts with another man. Same goes for if the wife sees her husband in the same case. Jealousy shows you care. When the jealousy is gone and that person is no longer jealous of you, then that's when you should be concerned. Not when they're jealous. That shows that they actually care. In Exodus 34, 15, it says, Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat, all, eat of his sacrifice. You see, when Israel would take on other gods, the Lord saw it as them whoring around. And when we put things before God, it's like we are letting the devil pimp us out for cheap because the pleasures of sin only last for a season. And it's like we're just giving ourselves over to him for some cheap thrill just for some quick m money some quick pleasure in exodus 34 16 it says and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons and their daughters go a whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods you see when you take on worldly wicked and lost spouses you'll end up sleeping sleeping around with all their gods their gods will live in your house, influence your kids. They'll be a big part of your life. And I thank God my wife doesn't listen to filthy music in front of the kids when she's driving down the road or listen to it, period. Because, you know, I've seen grown women, grown men and women, listening to filthy music like Cardi B driving down the road with their kid in the back listening to that filthy stuff that's raising them up to be like the lost world, like... It's teaching them the scum and filthy trash of this world. And it's just teaching them to just whore around with everything. That, that nothing is sinful. Nothing is dirty. And that filthy music is like, it's like going to the urinals in a gas station on a back road and eating your McDonald's combo meal out of that urinal. That's disgusting. But that's what that music does to you inside when you listen to it. And that Cardi B woman has her own meal at McDonald's now. You can't even go to McDonald's or go anywhere, period, just to get a quick bite to eat without seeing this stuff. 
She's got her own meal at McDonald's. If you're going to listen to her music, it does to you spiritually what eating out of that urinal would do. She's a very, very nasty, skanky woman. All that stuff is. The rap music, the rock music, the country music. It's filthy. It's going to mess you up on the inside. You're just taking trash in. Uh, the country music, all they do is talk about getting drunk and uh, say a lot of irreverent things. I got more respect for the rappers and the rockers than I do the country guys because the country guys were raised in the Bible Belt. They probably know better. You know, somebody raised in uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, went to church their whole life, heard the gospel. Obviously, they're going to be held a lot more accountable than Cardi B, who probably never even heard the gospel. Probably not ever even been to a real Bible-believing church, but you got a lot of the country people that know the gospel. They are going to be held even more account accountable. In Exodus 34, 17, it says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. You see, people got all kinds of gods that can hold in their hand, handheld gods. The Bible says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. You see, the sword is the Bible, spiritually speaking, and the average Christian today has the words of a Cardi B song in their mouth and an iPhone 4X Plus Max 10 Plus in their hand that looked and did about the same things that the previous six iPhones did, yet they just love it so much. In Exodus 34, 27, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables of the words of the covenant the Ten Commandments. Elijah and Jesus Christ himself also go 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking. And I wouldn't doubt if Paul did. You know, he said he was in fastings often. He might have skipped out on 40 days worth of food when he went into Arabia that time. Exodus 34, 29, It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand when he came down from the mount, that Moses wished not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So Moses' face was shining, kind of like the, the Lord Jesus in his glorified body. His countenance was like the sun shineth in his strength in Revelation 1. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Just like John was afraid of the Lord in Revelation 1, you see, Moses is a picture of the Lord. Remember, also he appears with the Lord himself on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, where in Matthew 17, 2, talking about the Lord, it says, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him, unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So you see the connection there. And in Exodus 34, 35, And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until they went in to speak with him. This pictures how Israel has a veil over their face when it comes to understanding the light of the world, the Lord Jesus. They don't understand. There's a veil covering that light. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 says, But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So you see the picture there. 